This is Coons Ford Turp Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. This is Wayne Viner. And oh, Todd Carton. Happy Valentine's Day. Because we love the Terps, so it's Terp Talk. And somebody else who loves those Terps as much as anybody else, intern Mason on the phone right now. Mason, welcome in this evening. It's a great evening to do it. Thanks for having me. It is. Uh, Maryland coming off a basketball loss at Lincoln, Nebraska, 70-66 last night. Mason and I watched that. Bruce was uh, watching the lacrosse game. Todd was at the lacrosse game. That's correct. Maryland takes it over Marist. Frank Reich, a Maryland quarterback, becomes the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts this week. We have a lot to talk about, including a top 10 women's team. We're going to get to all of that this afternoon, along with Dennis Gulatis, who will be in for the second segment. But I want to focus on the Maryland basketball team from last night. I'm going to leave the score out for a moment because it was a lot to talk about the actual game. But, Todd, do you think the team is any better than it was, let's say, four weeks ago? They may be marginally better than they were, Wayne, but it's hard to tell because the level of competition has dropped. So it may be that they look better. They're the same team. They're still losing games, especially on the road. They're losing those close games. They're not getting over the hump. Uh, and the level of competition has dropped, so that maybe they look better, but who? it's hard to tell. Mason, are they better or not better? I have to say that they're a little bit better just because of the way guys like Bruno Fernando and Daryl Morsell have been playing. Those are the two guys that people seem to be looking at when they're talking about general improvements. And Bruno, I can definitely say, seems to be a guy that really brings it on the road. Morsell had a great game against Northwestern, but looked rougher. I just think that they're just that little bit much better that makes them decent to watch most of the time. I'm going to go with the team overall is a little bit better, but so is everybody else. It's close to what Todd said. Maryland is much better when they play teams that don't have a legitimate inside presence of a center. That's still, I think, the weak point. Fernando, better than he was. He had a good game at Purdue, and that's the only big-time team they've played recently. They're going to get Michigan as the last game of the year. The player I'm most impressed with is a short-term turnaround is that Deion Wiley looks like a basketball player now. Well, he, he's certainly playing with some more confidence, and, and his shot looks much better. And, and again, we talked a little earlier about guys like Deion Wiley and Jared Nickens are maybe playing a, a little more freely now because they're not getting pulled after a single mistake or after missing a shot or two. They're going to stay out there because Turgeon's only got six, seven guys that he's, he's going to rotate through. Right, and Maryland changes the offense a bit, and they're going to stick with this four-guard look. It puts Daryl Morsell in as a power forward. Mason, what do you think of that for a guy who we thought might play point guard? It's definitely interesting, but at this point, it's what needs to be done. He's tough enough to do it. He has the mid-range game to do it. And certainly he can hold his own on defense against guys like Isaiah Roby for Nebraska who aren't as big. But who, who are it's the what guys had that, to be done. Who, who are the guys, Mason, that are blocking out on the boards and especially on missed free throws, which has been a real bugaboo and was again last night from the part of the game that I watched? Look, when you're playing a guy that's 6'4", 6'5", the power forward, things like that are going to happen. Well, they I are, but I was on the phone coming up here with Dave Neal, and he was 6'4", 6'5". They didn't give up as many defensive rebounds off of missed free throws. I, I think that really is a problem. I, yeah, they're trying as hard as they can. It's just not happening right now on the rebounding side. And I that points directly at the coach, right? I, I would guess you have to teach blocking out and those rebounding techniques. They don't really have a big man coach. And and it's it's just look it's looking at looking at you know some of this even happened though with Checo and Bruno in in the lineup on the free throw line so that to me points even more than say a guy like Morcel who probably never really had to learn boxing out at, at least in that particular situation. No, now I was talking to Todd earlier today uh, talking about the show. I said so you watch the game. 
he said part of it, and I think he brought up something that I've read online all day, which is, yeah, they got down the last minutes, they lost the game, just like every other time. Todd, you, you represent a large portion of the fan base, and I think anybody who's listening and still wants to talk Maryland basketball for a 6-9 and nine in conference record, but Todd, what's your overall feeling about watching these games? Well, I, I, I just... I've gotten kind of past the point where I, I want to experience the heartache of seeing Maryland game after game close, fall behind, close a gap, get to a, bas- a, a possession or two, and then just collapse in the last 35, 40 seconds. I watched the first half of the game last night. I, I was from left the lacrosse game, watched a bit of the second half just had the feeling that it was just going to be this sort of lather rinse repeat. <laughs> and and I thought, and and I thought I, I just I can't watch this anymore. I'll look at the score when it's over, and I'll see that they lost by you know seventy to sixty eight or sixty four to sixty two or something like that. Well, that that was about what happened. I felt free last night when Maryland came back. And it looked like it was going to get away, and Maryland comes back. I had forgotten that I was upset of the record. I forgot that I had questions about how this was all working, and I was able to actually enjoy the game. No, they didn't win. I was so happy when Bruno spun and dunked, and I think that got it down to one or two, and I looked at Kanye and said, yeah, I know, they don't have the lead yet. (laughs) Mason, were you in it, or were you just a a bystander last night? Well, I was very much in it for this one, and it still really upsets me when they lose games like this, where Nebraska's last made field goal was with five minutes and 42 seconds left, and they still lost the game. That's a tough one. Maryland, did you watch to the bitter end through that 542, Mason? Yeah. What, what? I think I left the TV on BTN until um, there were like 10 minutes left in the first half of the Northwestern Rutgers game. What did Maryland fail to do that, or, or that they couldn't get over that hump and, and put some real pressure on Nebraska to execute and, and force them to do something other than make free throws? I think that we've gotten to this point now in almost every game from the Purdue game to the Indiana game where Maryland has the chance and the shot to take the lead or to make it a one-point game, and they miss, and then they foul on the other end. Or, but the point where they get the wide-open three, the layup that Cowan missed, they just always seem to miss that shot this year, and that's where I personally think they really miss Mello Trimble. Okay, I think that to me, and this is 100% Maryland fan me, not objective observer, sometimes it looks like we cannot get a call. You said Cowan missed the layup. I think he got fouled. I saw Morcel bounce off of two guys, and the layup doesn't go. Like You can't have two guys run into somebody, and, and it's no call. Yeah, in Nebraska, there was one or two of those. And and then there was what I read about the, the phantom call on Herder early in the second half that I was listening on the radio. He wasn't fouled. He did, phantom call is a good way. It was phantom of the opera night. He wasn't. He, he didn't touch him. He should have, <laughs> but he didn't. The ref looked at that to me and said, oh, he had to foul him. He didn't touch him. Mason, did he touch him? No, I don't think so. And I also think that in this game with the refereeing, there were points where, like, Fernando has one foul and Herter has two, and they called it on Herter when it could have been on Fernando. It just seemed like every call where there were two guys that could have committed the foul, the ref just seemed to pick the one that had more fouls for the Terps. So part of this discussion, if you have to be overly honest, and that's what we're supposed to be doing, is how in the world did the Maryland Terrapins end up with five or six guys that can play at this level? Even if that, how in God's green earth do we only have one point guard? He's worn out. He goes three for 13. So when you look at Dion Wiley goes three for six, or Nickens has to come in for Herter and hits a three, where they usually miss those? Well, Cowan, who usually makes about half his shots, missed enough to make up for that. You end up at the same score. Bruce, look, I and, think. And, you know, Bruce says that you, you got to wait. The kids are coming. It's a bad year to jump on Turgeon. But there's still, we only had one point guard for five years now. And that's a big I issue. think at a point in this game, it just wasn't working for Cowan. When it's that bad, 
you got to take him off the floor for a minute, maybe two. I don't understand why he's still out there when he's three for 13, missing threes and layups. Well, you know, and, and is, is it that or is it partly that Cowan has to come to a point where he realizes – I'm not making shots. I got to get my get the ball to open teammates. You know, it's got to be Herder or or uh, Nickens or Wiley who are taking these shots, not me. I guess, but for the game, they shoot 48.3 percent. It's not overly bad. We haven't gotten, but yet when they had the chance to tie the game, Anthony Cowan turned the ball over. Would he have a shot blocked? Is that what I read? That, that he had a shot blocked, then there was a loose ball situation that Nebraska ended up winning. Okay. All right. Well, Maryland doesn't win this one. Six to nine. They have three games left. And you are listening to Coons Ford Presents Terp Talk. This Wednesday and every Wednesday here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio WJZAM in Baltimore. Todd, three, three games left. Three games left. You got Rutgers, which is Saturday night. Rutgers is no great shakes. No, and, and they're they're at home. That game's at home. Is that, that game is at Xfinity Center? At, X, at Xfinity Center. So, and Rutgers is al- as bad or almost as bad on the road as Maryland has been this year. On the road. On the but, road. So, right. so maybe okay. you win that one. You're maybe at, you win that at Northwestern in their temporary home, which is Rosemont, right near the airport. Yeah, not the greatest building in the world. And then Maryland closes it out. Michigan comes in. If you win all three of those, you end up at nine and nine. It's not impossible. You'd be twenty and eleven for the season going to the Big Ten tournament. Mason, if you win those, what else do you have to do? Do you think to make the NCAA tournament? I think at that point they're going to have to make a Big Ten semifinal or final appearance. Yeah, I I don't think yeah. the semifinal is enough. That would be two wins. They they would need three to get to the semis. Is that right? Because they'll they'll play four games. Yeah, but they're going to play Thursday, Friday, Friday Saturday, Saturday, and maybe Sunday. I mean that that so it's four games. So you need three wins to get to to the final. And and I think that that they need it. You know, I mean, look, Nebraska is going to finish in the top four, get a double bye, and nobody's talking about Nebraska even being a bubble team at this point. I can't see how Maryland's going to vault ahead of them. It's not like you know Maryland played a string of high-profile non-conference opponents, uh, as at least as I recall the schedule. Why, Mesa? Why do you think that Nebraska's to me is getting job? They're third in the Big Ten, but they're not even in the conversation. Well, they're very much in the conversation. They're almost in every first four out as the first team. They just played the 57th hardest schedule. And when you look at it, they didn't beat anybody in the non-conference. They only played one game against a ranked team in the non-conference, which was Kansas, their only home loss on the season. And they're playing the Week Big Ten, and they haven't beat any of the big powers in the Big Ten. All right, let me take uh, one look at the Big Ten standings here. For people who hope or, or think Maryland could fall into the bottom four and have to play on Wednesday. The Iowa Hawkeyes are 3-11, and Minnesota 3-12, and Rutgers 3-12, and Illinois 2-11. and If they all win their final three games, I, I don't think they catch Maryland. Even if Maryland loses all the games, I don't see these three teams, four teams catching Maryland. I think Maryland at least gets to go on and start their Big Ten tournament run on March 1st, which is Thursday. Well, and of course, if Maryland beats Rutgers, that knocks them out of that possibility. That, that is correct. That is correct. So any, how many people do you think are going to get to Madison Square Garden? You think that place is going to sell out for the Big Ten tournament? No. And that's it. That's that's pretty blunt. That's an inter- kind of an interesting question because uh, I was talking actually. I was a, and and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the women's basketball team. But I was at women's basketball practice yesterday and chatting with Brenda Fries. And the women's tournament this year is in the same weekend, and it's unusual for that to be the case. It's usually the women's tournament first, then men's tournament. And she said that ticket sales have been down for the women's tournament, both on Maryland's allotment and across the board. So I don't know if that's an indication that people just aren't interested in the women's game or that more people are going to New York. I mean, I know I know if I had to choose, I'd go to New York and not to Indianapolis. Okay. Well, I'm going to New York. Uh, I'm going to check this out. I want to go to a game, a basketball game at Madison Square Garden that Maryland plays in. 
Anybody who's listening who wants to go, come on, because there's additional tickets available. All sessions are available. You can go to the Big10.org website and buy your Big Ten tournament tickets. So for the first year in a while, for, for me, Todd's really invested, literally, in, in men's lacrosse. You, you put it up, you bought some season tickets on top of everything else you're doing, and you're committed to going every home game? I am committed to going to every home game because I've, I've weatherproofed my season. <laughs> You'd be sitting inside. That helped against Navy and Marist. Yeah, it really did. I mean, it was wet and rainy against the uh, Navy, and it was it was brisk last night. And we'll say that it was brisk. In the two games, the depending on what poll you look at, I'll just call them the number one ranked Maryland Terrapins in my poll have outscored the opponents twenty three to eleven. Uh, for the two games, what are your highlights of the season so far? Well, Dan Morris has been great in goal. He's saving shots at about a sixty seven percent clip. The defense is just off the chart again and particularly you you don't have Bryce Young uh, who's played in either hasn't played in either game because and he's a preseason all-American so you know you you plug him back in and that defense should get even better and and offensively Maryland has just shown a lot of weapons you know you didn't get much from Bernhardt and Kelly against Navy and then last night Bernhardt was just a manimal uh, he was unstoppable five goals two assists Kelly Kelly had four and four, you know, I mean, and just rockets. So, you know, I, I, I really like what I see. The, the one big question is going to be Austin Henningsen, who was not very good against Navy, was very good last night. But I don't think Marist's uh, Fogo is the, the quality of folk faceoff man he's going to face once they get into the tougher schedule and into the Big Ten. Last night, Henningsen was 16 for 22. Mason, you follow this quite closely. You were uh, standing there with Dan Morris after the Navy game. He was pretty wet, wasn't he? Yeah, it's definitely a different game out there when you're playing goalie and it's raining. Oh, how do you like him as what seems to be now the quarterback of the defense? I like it a lot, and he's proven himself very well so far. And last year, he said now that some of his guys, his deep holes are gone. He has to be a lot more vocal, and so far it seems to be working. What is the difference? Does it affect the goalie more to be looking into the rain and trying to pick the ball up than it does anybody else, or is it sort of equal out there? I think it affects the goalie more just because they're facing a lot more shots compared to passes. It just changes you know, what you're looking for with the ball on a nice sunny day. It's really easy to see the ball come out of the stick, get a nice read on it on a rainy day. You know, it's just, it's blurry, and to see the ball come out of the stick gets a little bit tougher. Well, I have to say, I hope this is a year that that Danny Morris gets his due. I think he suffered a little bit uh, last year in terms of being underappreciated following on the heels of Amato and Burnlor, that he wasn't that uh, spectacular uh, acrobatic kind of guy, but he sure gets the job done. Well, he's got one more thing those guys don't. When, what is that? That's right, the national championship. <laughs> so I'd take that over a little bit of flash any day. Terps are at High Point, High Point, North Carolina, on Saturday at 12. I'm not even sure that one made BTN+. Plus. Penn comes in here, the Penn Quakers, Wednesday the 21st at 5. Todd will be there, and uh, we might get a live update. Hat and all. Yes, the famous hat. And then it gets really good. Mason and I, and the whole gang, will be out there as Notre Dame and then Albany. Both big-time lacrosse programs come in March 3rd, uh, March 10th. We'll have to drag Mason out. He's got some uh, academic tests that morning, so he'll be up all, all day for this one. Albany comes in. They might even be a Final Four favorite still. They, they certainly could be. And, and then you get, again, the Big Ten is the toughest conference in the country. Despite For, some early losses. Right. Might not be the best basketball conference at the moment, but they're the best lacrosse. And with that, we're going to head to break. Dennis Kulatsis will be on to talk about Frank Reich and all the NFL news after this commercial message. You are listening to Turp Talk this Wednesday here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Good evening, Terp fans. This is Wayne Viner. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening in with Todd Carton. And on the phone, 
is our NFL expert, Dennis Kulatsis. Dennis, welcome into Terp Talk tonight. Hey, thank you, Wayne, for having me on. So I want to talk a little bit about one of the biggest items in in Terp news this week is that Frank Reich, who used to play quarterback at the University of Maryland, is now the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. Is was that a bigger surprise to you as it was to me? I, I think it was a bigger surprise to Frank because it looked <laughs> like this this year's coaching carousel had passed him by. But uh, wow, what a what a great turn of events for him! I wish he had gone to a better organization, but. Look, it's his first stint, and uh, hopefully he gets a healthy Andrew Luck. That'll go a long way towards making the, his career there a success. If Andrew Luck can't go, he's going to have an uphill battle with that, with that team as it currently sits. On the surprise meter, if Andrew Luck can go, I'm going to be surprised. Todd, the young man, has just gotten beat up at the NFL level, and he, he really hasn't been Andrew Luck for a while. For a while, yeah, from from what I've seen. And, and I'm not I'm – not, uh, great uh, follower of the NFL. I'm a Terp guy. We, we talked a little bit about this, but, you know, it's nice. Frank Reich is going to go to Indianapolis, and he should have a ring and that he, that he didn't yeah, have. Yeah. Super Bowl ring. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be nice. So that'll, that'll be a nice little thing to flash around and hopefully convince his players that he knows what he's doing. But all of us have followed Maryland for a long time. Uh, Dennis, do you have any special recollections of the miracle in Miami? Oh yeah, I mean Frank Frank Reich. Uh, look, he's a comeback kid, uh, and look, he's been a he was a career backup quarterback in the NFL. Look, and he was also the backup head coach for the Indianapolis Colts, and he got the job. <laughs> great, great offensive, great offensive mind uh, that he is. And look, I was kind of he was my dark horse pick for the Ravens next season if uh, if John Harbaugh misses the playoffs again. So it was for that reason I was sad to see him go to the Colts because I thought with his offensive mind. He would have been a perfect fit, you know, a local guy right here in Baltimore and in line for the, uh, to, for, to become Eric DaCosta's first pick as head coach if, if uh, somehow the, uh, the Ravens missed the playoffs this year again. As a career backup guy for Frank Reich, I mean, he sat by, behind Boomer Esiason for Maryland for three years. He was behind Jim Kelly yeah. in the Buffalo Bills for a while. But he had the two biggest comebacks at that time, both in college, the Miracle of Miami, and then a playoff yeah. game. Right. And and the thing that, that, that I always sort of sticks with me about the Miami comeback when he was with Maryland is that that's a signal moment for a lot of Maryland fans. But nationally, despite it being at that time the biggest kind for a long time afterward, the biggest comeback ever, not a lot of people remember that because two weeks later, Doug Flutie threw the, the famous yeah. Hail Mary – for Boston College and beat Miami. Right. Well, so in this case, fortune has shined upon Frank. You win a Super Bowl, become a head coach all in the same week. Not too bad. Now, I know that no. the, the Ravens Never. still looking for some answers at wide receiver, and a story broke on Sports Illustrated where they listed the potential cap casualties. Players are going to have to be cut at the NFL level because of cap space. Des Bryant's on there. Randall Cobb from the Packers. Crabtree from the Raiders. Alan Hearns, pretty good from the Jaguars. Brandon LaFell, who I sort of like from the Bengals, and he's been in your branch of the NFL there. Jeremy Macklin from the Ravens. Maybe Brandon Marshall from the Giants. Any of those players seem to fit what the Ravens want to do? Well, you know what? A lot of those players fit, Wayne, but talk about the cap, the Ravens are tight up against the cap. They'll have to move some money around to get the right player at the right price. Uh, I just don't see how they can get a top-tier wide receiver to come in. I think they'll have to rely uh, on the draft uh, for firepower wide receiver. You take a guy like Michael Crabtree, there's a reason why people don't want him in the locker room. So uh, I don't know that they want to uh, offset uh, talent with, uh, with uh, off-field issues and to mess up some chemistry in the locker room. So they're going to have to compromise something. Uh, and it all depends on how they feel about Mike Wallace and Jerry Macklin. Jerry Macklin is still under contract, 50-50, whether he comes back or not, whether they want him back or not. Same thing with, with Mike Wallace. So, And they still have to sign Ryan Jensen. I would think he's going to come in in the 8 to $9 million per year. I can't imagine not, not you know, having a center. Uh, he did a great job with their scheme. They're bringing back everybody uh, offensive line-wise last year, the same offensive line coach, Greg Roman now, is assistant head coach in charge of the running game. So, they, they have, they have. I just don't know if they have the money to allocate these wide receivers. It's sexy to talk about them, but at the end of the day, I just don't see them. Look, maybe they'll, they'll give Rashard Perryman one more try because it's the fourth year of his rookie contract. But 
Uh, I've even heard Jimmy Graham, but his name's thrown around. But I keep asking the question, where is that money going to come from? Well, Jensen at center is, is grouped in with a couple of players like a, a Travis Swanson from the Lions, but he's missed a few games. I mean, Jensen's looked at as a fighter. Uh, an older fellow who might fit in is John Sullivan from the Rams. He's a really smart center, but he's a little long in the tooth. But, yes, yeah, something has to give there. Who is the best speed receiver that you see that's on the board the Ravens could pick up? Wow, the best speed receiver. That's a, that's a great, great question. Um, there's uh, Christian Kirk, a uh, guy out of uh, Texas A&M. I like him a lot for blazing speed. But, look, uh, give me D.J. Moore, hopefully, in the second round. I want a guy with hands. Never mind speed. We have a guy that's really fast <laughs> for Shard Perryman. Just have him run nine routes. But give me a receiver that can work underneath, can work the slot. A guy that's reliable for Joe Flacco in second and third round. Down. They just don't have a guy with great hands on this team. And that's what the Ravens really miss is those reliable guys that can go across the middle, that can win the 50-50 jump balls. But there's plenty of talent in this year's draft in the second, the third, and fourth round. So they don't have to take a wide receiver at the first round. I think Ravens Nation will implode if they take a, you know, an inside linebacker. Uh, if Roquan Smith is there, for instance, which I don't think he will be at number 16. But, look, if they, if they, get, the, if they get the right player, if somebody drops it's, uh, on the defensive side of the ball, it wouldn't shock me if they, if they stayed true to the board and took the best player available. You know, you you talk, Dennis, about uh, Flacco needing a guy that that he can feels like he can rely on, and isn't that when he had his best years? When he had a Todd yeah. Heap that he he looked to him for every third down, and even Brady, who looks to Amendola or Gronkowski. Um, and and as far as the money is concerned, Dennis, I think you know you may be you may be a great uh, car dealership manager, but you're you're not a, you're not an accountant because if you ask an accountant how much two plus two is, the the correct answer is how much do you want it to be? Right, that's exactly right. That's a, that's a great point. But you know you make a great point. Back in 2012, when the Ravens won the Super Bowl with Joe Flacco, his targets were a healthy Dennis Pitta. He had Ray Rice uh, coming off of a Pro Bowl year in the backfield. He had Anquan Bolden. He had Jacoby Jones. I mean, the guy had some weapons. So when people knock Flacco and ask me what I think about Joe Flacco is, look, if you give an offensive line a running game and some time, he can pick you apart. Got to get him some receivers versus that JV squad they had out there for him this year. That, that all is true. Now, you mentioned Torrey Smith. And you were really high uh, on him at one point as the Maryland's best receiver in a while. Then we had Diggs, and now you have DJ, DJ Moore. Moore. Yeah, it's a string. You're going to have a point here where if everybody sticks around, you're going to have some big time Maryland wide receivers in the league at, at the same time. And I remember I was reminiscing with Todd. There was a time when Maryland had five or six legit quarterbacks in the NFL at one time. Yeah. It seems so long ago that we were quarterback. You we have a little run as receiver. You right now, but uh, who we had a Siason. Yeah, Zolak, Reich, um, Neil O'Donnell. Neil O'Donnell. Oh yeah. And I'm uh, missing on one or two, but yeah. we, we had a, a whole pile of quarterbacks. Those were the, the great years. Hopefully, D.J. Durkin will get this ship turned around for the Maryland Terps on the right, football DJ, side. And here's another point. D.J. Moore, let me look at the look at the quarterbacks, no disrespect, that were thrown at him this year. We're talking about second, third, and fourth spring guys, right? So he didn't have you know, a, a, you know an all-conference quarterback throwing at him. So I think when you factor that in and you, you roll the tape on this young man, he reminds me of a, of a poor man, Steve Smith. You know, same build, same tenacity, same attitude, great hands, great routes. Uh, look, I like him a lot. I've not seen him mocked in the first round, so I'm, I'm hoping that the quarterbacks push him down to the second round, and I hope the Ravens, uh, they, they get him. I mean, there's no reason they, you know, they, they can't keep passing on local talent. I mean, look, they're right down the street. They don't have to invest in you know, hotels or, or plane trips to see these receivers firsthand. And how they miss... Uh, on these other guys, it's just beyond me. Right, and they have. So let's uh, take a look at, I'm taking a look at the used cars over at Coons Ford this week. You know, if, if you're not in the mood for a new car, you guys will sell them a used car, and if you don't like it in a week, you can take it back. Is that true? Yeah, we know we have an exchange program. It's really a return program. Look, if somebody doesn't doesn't like it, uh, I don't want them having heartburn over it. Uh, but most of the time, Look, we take back a handful of vehicles a year, but if somebody look, takes a vehicle home and you know, they take a sedan, they, they decide they want an SUV, we can certainly swap them out of it. That's what we do. Well, you, you know how to take care of people. I'm looking at one in particular, a 2015 Ford Fusion. Looks like it's all the options, only 18,000-plus miles, under 15000 bucks. 
you guys really do it right out there. Todd? Oh, I, I, was, I was just wondering if, if, they were, if the term is not now previously owned. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is previously owned. I, I'm looking at the wrong page. I take that back. Thanks, Todd. We, we, also, we also use the term previously loved, too. That's the free love. That's previously the loved. That's another a good one, Dennis. Term. I like that. that is yeah. any, anything else going on special out there? Yeah, we have a big, a big President's Day sale this weekend. It uh, starts uh, right now and goes for the end of the month. So you know, folks don't have to wait until Monday to come out and enjoy the savings. We have a great selection. Most vehicles you can get 0% for 72 months, but there's cash coming back. We always give people 125% of Cape, uh, Kelly Blue Book value as well. So, uh, look, I want to thank everyone out there that keeps coming to our store and referring customers to us. To us. We do a great job with repeat and referral business, and this is a great weekend to come out and, and save a ton of money and, Get yourself a new ride for the spring season. All right. You can find Dennis Kulatsis at 6970 Security Boulevard at Coons Ford of Baltimore. And you can also find him down the radio dial tomorrow afternoon. Where is that? Well, up, up, up the dial, down the dial. But uh, it's, uh, they, can, they can Google my name, Dennis Kulatsis, and they'll see some great things attached to it, hopefully, and uh, tune in. And, and hopefully uh, we can get Bruce on tomorrow as well. All right. Dennis, thanks for checking in this week. Uh, we're going to be back to talk uh, volleyball, baseball, women's basketball, and everything else we haven't covered yet with Todd Carton, who is the king of the non-revenue sports. We'll be back in a few minutes here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. This is Coons Ford Term Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Bruce is away from the microphone. This is Wayne Viner and Todd Carden in this Valentine's Wednesday. I hope you guys aren't out there stuck in traffic, but if you are, we, we've got still some Maryland sports to cover here. Lots of Maryland sports to cover. There's a lot. Uh, we were just talking okay. about whether or not with all of these non-rev and all these great rivalries that you've seen on your side, and I talk about football and basketball, do you miss the ACC or have you completely moved on to the Big Ten? Personally, I've completely moved on to the Big Ten. I, you know, I think that when you talk about rivalries, I think Maryland Duke in men's basketball for five or eight years or so was an intense rivalry for the players, and it was an intense rivalry for Maryland fans. I don't think Duke fans cared quite as much. For them, it was always Carolina. Oh, boo. When Amex made a commercial with Krzyzewski in the commercial, the team they were playing in the commercial was not Carolina. It was Maryland. Well, but I also remember when it was NC State was the big rival in basketball, and it was Carolina, uh, and Wake for a little bit. But but after after we got past the lefty years, was NC State ever really a big rival? Uh, you know, I mean, Maryland's rivalries. Maryland never really had a rival. Closest, I guess, you could come, and I shudder to say this is Virginia nah. in the ACC. Right. Nah, not really. Not really. Not really. But whether it's the Big Ten or the ACC, 16 years of Brenda Freeze has brought, see, the Todd Carton countdown, one national championship. Take it from here. One national championship, uh, two Final Fours, and two more. Uh, that, that's discounting the national right. championship. So, this is the Todd Carton countdown. And two more Elite Eights that I could think of off the top of my head and a handful of Sweet Sixteens as well. All right. And this basketball so, team this year had injuries at the same level as uh, maybe a Maryland football team, it seems, and yet Brenda delivers a top-10 team. How do you do that? Well, it's one key injury. It was Blair Watson, who was their second-best uh, three-point shooter and their best perimeter defender. What she had, really, was four players transfer. So that, that depleted, Transfer out. Transfer out. So that depleted her roster a lot, but the team you know, I had to recover from the shock of losing Watson and, and they've done that. And, and, and I think again, Brenda, I think this is probably, if not her best year, it's certainly among the top two or three years of, of her coaching at Maryland. And, but there's still enough of a gap in women's basketball that between where Maryland is in terms of talent and where say would they play Purdue tomorrow and Purdue is about 50 something in the I RPI there's enough of a gap there that Maryland should win that game almost every time whereas on the men's side th that gap is much narrower so where does the gap start well I think that that there's a lot of parity between uh, roughly the top 16 to 20 teams on the women's side and then there's another layer of parity between say 21 and 45 and then 
you know, you get about above that, the layers match. But when you have, say, 18 or 19 playing 50, 18 or 19 is going to win that game 95 times out of 100. So Maryland is making it just because their overall quality of the in team par- makeup is it, just superior to the rest of the Big Ten? In 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 part, um, that that's they, they, there's a lot of talent on Maryland, and in part it's coaching, and it, in part it's adjustments, and the team having really bought in. Uh, I was talking to Brenda yesterday, and she she talked about how much she just loves this team and how it's a kind of a drama free season. And and the team has really bought in, and they're they're just really underrated. People think about Brenda Freeze, and they think about offense, but this team is really underrated defensively. And I've written about that on TerpTalk.com, uh, lauding Maryland's defense. That's what's carrying through them, carrying them through a lot of these tough road games. So, how do you have to finish up to win the Big Ten? Uh, two games. If they win two of their last four, they get, can have no worse than a tie for the conference title. And the Big Ten Women's Tournament is in? Indianapolis. Cool. Uh, same weekend as the Men's Tournament. Which one are you going to? Uh, I, right now, I'm not sure I'm going to either uh, tournament, but again, I've been to Indianapolis and given a choice between Indianapolis and New York. Well, like I said, I've been to Indianapolis. You've been <laughs> All right. Well, that that's uh, resounding. Wow. Uh, women's lacrosse. Uh, two minutes on a defending national Champion, uh, well, you know, they had their first game last Sunday. They, they ran out to a 15-2 to two lead, and unlike men's lacrosse, you get a 10-goal lead. The clock doesn't stop. And by the time the second half rolled around, uh, Kathy Reese used 33 of the 35 players who were on her roster who were dressed and eligible to play. And and so the final score is a little deceiving, but... You know, uh, transfer. They have a transfer from Louisville, who was a third-team All-American, a kid named Megan Syverson, who's going to be great, as well as the returners on the team. Uh, Julia Bragg is stepping up as the next big defender. Megan Whittle, of course, Caroline Steele, uh, who the lacrosse team sent out a great tweet since it's Valentine's Day about they're going to steal your heart with a picture of Caroline Steele. Nice, nice work there. Baseball. There's a new coach on the baseball side. What's going on with that team? Baseball, yeah, new new coach, part of a, I think, kind of a youth movement at Maryland in head coaches because you started a couple of years ago with D.J. Durkin, who just turned 40 uh, about three weeks ago. Um, you hired uh, Rob Vaughn in June when John Sheff left. Uh, Rob has been with the program for five years. He was the associate head coach, so he they, they promoted him. And uh, he's really known for developing players and for his recruiting prowess, so that's a positive. And then, of course, the new volleyball coach, Adam Hughes. who uh, Rob, is, Rob isn't even 30 yet as a head coach, and Adam Hughes, the new volleyball coach, about 32 or 33. We'll get to Adam in a moment. Uh, Maryland has some... Some depth on baseball. We heard about a top 300 player. Yeah, uh, Maryland, Maryland, the big question mark for Maryland going into this season is, is going to be their pitching staff. Uh, it, it's great. Their, their Friday night starter is, is going to be a guy named Tyler or Taylor Bloom. Their Saturday night starter is Tyler Blom. And then on Sunday, it'll be Hunter Parsons. And um, a lot of these guys had great years two years ago, but struggled a little bit last year or had up and down and some inconsistency last mm-hmm. year, was their first year under a new pitching coach, a guy named Ryan Fecto, who actually went to um, a, a Virginia Tech with Chef, and they brought in a guy, uh, Morocco, I think, or something like that. I, I can't remember his name. The new pitching coach, he came from St. John's in New York University, and he's had the last three Big East pitchers of the year. So, if they get those guys settled in, uh, Maryland offensively is going to be really terrific. The The player you mentioned uh, is Randy Bednar, and he'll platoon in right field with another freshman named uh, Richie Shykoffer. Um Offensively, Maryland brings back just a ton of guys, um, Marty Costas and Zach Jankarski, Nick Dunn, who's a preseason All-American at second base, A.J. Lee, who exploded on the scene last year as a sophomore. It just seems to be at a different level. And when you go on the online forums and you look at Maryland baseball, there's posts and there's people who talk about this. 
I went to Maryland. You've been around here. Bruce went to Maryland. People didn't talk about baseball. We would have had this show 10 years ago. Nobody would have said anything about baseball. Yeah. But now it's starting to pick up for real. For real. And and that, that actually goes goes back to uh, uh, Backage, Eric Backage, who, who came in a couple of years, five, six, eight years ago, so, sort of generated some excitement. And then Chef came in. Maryland's been to a bunch of NCAA tournaments, something they hadn't done since 1970. And that has generated a lot of excitement around the program. And, and ESPN helps because the NCAA games are on television. And you can watch it if they, they went out to L.A. a couple of years ago and actually won a few games and got to come back and play a Super Regional on the East Coast. And that, that was really cool. Yeah. Volleyball change coaches. You liked the the last guy. You seem to like this guy. Give me one minute on why we lost a coach to Indiana and who the new guy is. Um complex reasons as to why we lost a coach to Indiana. I'm going to say partly because Indiana uh, is building in the process of building a new seventeen million dollar facility. That's Steve Aird, uh, the former coach, and uh, they're building a new seventeen million dollar facility out there exclusively for volleyball and wrestling. And um, Maryland has a kind of a cramped facility with most of their games in the pavilion, which has a capacity of about. 1800 or so maybe 2000 on a good night all right so he leaves they're putting big money into this and who's the new guy the new guy is adam hughes who came with steve and he has this a similar penn state pedigree boo but we'll take it <laughs> uh yeah we were we were our coaching staff here at maryland was penn state south it was uh steve was penn state right. adam penn state the wrestling coach uh, Kerry McCoy and and no, but on, in volleyball, Kristen Carpenter, yep. who who stayed on as an assistant, was also a Penn State player. Mm -hmm. um, Adam, again, he's a young guy. He was named one of the top coaches, one of the top thirty coaches under thirty about three years ago. Has really strong local ties mm -hmm. on the club volleyball scene, and I think maybe even a little better of an X's and O's guy than right. Steve. Well Maryland was a bubble team for the NCAA tournament. Do you think he stays if we made it, or was he going anyhow? Steve. Steve. Um, given some of the things that I've heard, I think he, he might have gone anyway. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, outlook for the NC two A's with the new guy and the, and the new recruits. Well, I, I know it's a false sport, but yeah, I, I think this year could be a little bit of a struggle. Maryland has well a couple of players, a couple of their big front line players. Gia Milana, who was Steve's big uh, first big recruit, is going to transfer to Baylor, and our uh, an opposite girl named Sam Drexel. Uh, who's from Washington is going home to be closer to home. So they're, they're a little thin, and we'll have to see what kind of players he can bring in. We have uh, Speedy Jones' daughter, though, coming in. Uh, Raynell will be coming in as a freshman in the cool. fall. So uh, the last couple minutes here, we got to do one cool thing about two weeks ago. We went out to UMBC to open the new arena. Uh, you heard anything from them? I know we did a Terp Talk segment on the court there. Yeah, they, they, were, they were thrilled with the segment. Uh, I know a lot of folks out there saw it. They, some direct messaged me on Twitter, on Twitter <laughs> yeah. or Twitter, whatever that thing is called. <laughs> and and, and they, they were just thrilled to have us and, and glad that we were, were there to do the show. And it, it's, a, it's a nice arena, and, and I'm really proud of my alma mater. Uh, last Wednesday after the show, we did the first segment live. Then I went with Mason to Under Armour's global headquarters. Bruce followed after the show. Maryland put on a heck of a hype night for football. You've been to those before. Your overall impression is that... When you walk out of there, DJ Durkin makes you think that every recruit coming in is is a five star, regardless of where the services rank him, and and that uh, every coach, every assistant coach on his staff is 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 national championship caliber. You're just ready to run through the wall. I was ready to run through the wall. Even Bruce thought we were turning the corner. I think now that we actually gonna have sixty kids or a three star, four star, five star on that team, the depth is there. Folks, we are running up against the clock. Uh, we will be back on Saturday morning here at 1300 CBS Sports Radio. And we're going to be talking about a, a huge weekend in sports. It's the NBA uh, All-Star Game. And we're really interested. Are the Wizards better with or without John Wall? So we'll talk about that on Saturday morning. Thanks for listening, Todd. And happy thanks. Valentine's Day to everybody stuck in traffic. Thanks to Mason. Thanks to Dennis. We will see you next time on Saturday morning, 
on the Sports Maven.